Hi, welcome to Baden Hill Academy. We're going to be talking today about how the United States continued to evolve and grow into a world power. My goal is to make this video very short, so some of these topics I'm barely going to touch on, but you can either research on your own or you can look at the lessons that we'll go over in class. Uh, some of the readings will help you understand more deeply what we're referring to. So this lesson begins with the Spanish-American War. You need to know that the Spanish-American War was a turning point in U.S. history. The United States wanted to grow as a world power. In order to do that, the United States needed a navy. And one of the main proponents of building a navy was Alfred Mann. Remember that? It starts with an M. Mann was a, uh, a great thinker, but uh, he had started in the navy and he actually didn't like going to sea very much and was involved in two collisions where he almost died. And as a result, he really wanted to do something else. And so he wrote books. He wrote 20 books, 100 articles about how the United States should build a Navy. He was a friend of Teddy Roosevelt, and so he had some power. So his views were basically expansionist views. On the other side, I want to talk about another guy whose name starts with M. His name is Jose Marti. So Man and Marti. Marti was someone who fought against expansionism, particularly in Cuba. He was a revolutionary writer and uh, unfortunately the Spanish government, because the Spanish controlled Cuba, they didn't like him very much and they eventually exiled him. But uh, he eventually made his way back and he, he led a revolutionary movement in Cuba trying to get rid of the Spanish government. He died in 1895 as a revolutionary, but his ideas lived on. In 1898, there, because trouble was brewing in Cuba and Cuba was close to the United States, the United States thought maybe we should get involved. There were a lot of reasons for the United States getting involved and, and some of them had to do with money because the United States could make a lot of money from Cuba. And remember, the United States wanted to increase its power worldwide. One of its warships, the USS, the USS Maine, was docked in Havana Harbor. And suddenly there was an explosion. Immediately the United States and especially the media, the newspapers of the time said, oh, this is the Spanish government, this is their fault. And so the U.S. declared war on Spain. When they declared war on Spain, that meant declaring war on Spain everywhere, even in places as far away as the Philippines. And so the United States went to war with Spain. Admiral Dewey took his fleet of ships to the Philippines and sank all of the Spanish ships and basically won the war. Uh, there was also a land battle, and this involved Teddy Roosevelt in Puerto Rico. The famous battle uh, is called the Charge uh, Up San Juan Hill, and Teddy Roosevelt led the Rough Riders to victory. He became very popular with Americans and eventually became President of the United States very shortly after that. Now, how did Americans feel about this war? Well, Se Secretary of State John Hay described it in this way. He said it was a splendid little war. Why was it splendid? Because the United States won all these treasures, these territories. And why was it little? Because it happened so quickly and without really any loss, very much loss of American life. So what was going on in the places that the U.S. was invading Cuba and the Philippines. Uh, they had basically already started insurrections. The people there were fighting against the Spanish government before the United States even came. And uh, in Cuba, Marti led the battle cry, led with the battle cry, Cuba Libre. Cuba Libre means free Cuba. And he wanted to have an independent Cuba and Many Americans had promised him and others that, okay, if you help us uh, fight against the Spanish, then we'll give you your freedom and your independence. The same thing happened in the Philippines with a man named 
Emilio Aguinaldo. Uh, Aguinaldo was promised that the Philippines would be independent after the war, but it, it didn't work out that way. And Aguinaldo then became a revolutionary against the United States. And they were using guerrilla, guerrilla warfare. That means that soldiers were fighting not in lines and rows and in the traditional way, but fighting from the bushes and attacking in small groups by surprise. Now, what were the costs of, of not just the Spanish-American War, but the insurrections, and specifically the insurrection in the Philippines? Well, you need to know that hundreds of thousands of Filipino people died. And so this is, this is really a black mark on U.S. history. We gained territory and control, and we had good reasons. We wanted to uh, promote democracy. We wanted to help people uh, become more educated and, and share with them civilization. We wanted to maybe help them become Christian. But the problem is we used our power, we forced them to do things our way, and we need to look at that very closely. Uh, what about these territories? Let's look at some of these territories that were acquired over the course of the late 1800s, starting with Hawaii. Now, Hawaii has a different story. It wasn't a part of the Spanish-American War, but it was a prize in the middle of the Pacific. And as Alfred Mann wanted to expand the U.S. Navy and Americans realized that we needed Navy bases further out into the ocean, Hawaii was a prime target. Hawaii was also a target first for missionaries. People, Americans wanted to go there to uh, convert people to Christianity and also for businesses. It was a beautiful place where things would grow magically. And so uh, missionaries and business people went to Hawaii first. And there was already a government there. There was uh, a monarchy with kings and queens and the last queen was named Queen Liliuokalani. She was very well educated and uh, really an important figure in history. But she was uh, under pressure. And remember, Hawaii had been discovered by the English, the British, by Captain James Cook, who sailed around the world and went to Australia and New Zealand. And uh, he sailed because uh, the Earl of Sandwich sponsored his journeys. And so that's why Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands were called the Sandwich Islands for so many years. Well, that was artificial, right? They already had a name, Hawaii, and they already had a government, but the Americans eventually would want to get rid of that government and take it over for themselves. And so, uh, one name you need to know is the Dole family. The Doles, like Dole Pineapple, they were involved from the very beginning and they developed a uh, pineapple company, produce company. And at first, Sanford Dole uh, was responsible for starting a coup, an insurrection uh, that happened in 1893 and 1894. The insurrection was basically led by American business people who wanted to over, overthrow the Hawaiian government so that they could control the Hawaiian islands. And James Dole is the one who really started the company, uh, but they were, they were cousins and, and family members. So the Dole family had a lot of property in Hawaii. Now, you need to know about the presidents at this time and how they felt about expansionism versus isolationism. Now, Grover Cleveland, who was strangely president twice, but not one after the other, uh, President Cleveland did not promote expansionism. And Queen Lilio Kalani actually appealed to, to President Cleveland, and he agreed that the U.S. should not annex Hawaiian Islands. That means they should allow Hawaii to be independent and free. But Cleveland didn't stay president forever and President McKinley became president after him. And McKinley was an expansionist and saw Hawaii as a gift from the gods and uh, supported annexation. That means that Hawaii became a territory and a 
possession of the United States. Uh, so different from Cuba and the Philippines, which were eventually going to become independent, uh, but you know, the Hawaii didn't have any choice. And um, you can see then that this provided a foothold for the new Navy, America's new Navy. And uh, this is one territory that the U.S. acquired along with Guam and then Puerto Rico, which were also islands that could provi provide naval bases for the U.S. in order for the U.S. to expand its power. So we kind of have two different situations. We have territories, Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico. They are possessions of the United States. And we also have occupations like Cuba, the Philippines, and another one, Panama. So uh, Cuba, as I said, had a U.S. military gover governor and then uh, basically a U.S. sponsored constitution that allowed the U.S. to have a lot of control of Cuba. Um, there, there are three things you need to know that, um, first of all, the U.S. had what was called the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine was under President Monroe. It was a policy developed that said no European power, no country from Europe should get involved in this part of the world, the Western Hemisphere, we'll call it. And so that was from President Monroe's time. He said, no more European meddling. Well, remember, Spain still had those colonies. And so the Monroe Doctrine was kind of going against that Spanish colonization. So when President Roosevelt took over, he had what was called the Roosevelt Corollary. And his idea was, if there's any problem in this part of the world, we will get involved with that country to make sure that it doesn't affect our interests. So the U.S. believed that even though they didn't control certain countries, that if something was going on in that country, that the U.S. had a right to go in with their military and put down any trouble. And so this was very important, the Roosevelt Corollary. And this was extended in Cuba with the Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment, uh, by sponsored by Orville Platt, uh, he, it basically said that the U.S. had a right to do whatever they needed to do in Cuba to keep order. So those are all important things to remember. Also remember that President Roosevelt continued to build the Navy and he sent out the Great White Fleet. This is, this is a, a huge fleet of warships that was sent around the world. This was a peaceful mission. You can say peaceful, but remember the point is that the U.S. wanted the whole world to know how powerful they were. And um, this was one thing that Roosevelt did. Another thing that Roosevelt did was to create the Panama Canal. And this meant taking over a section of Central America, the isthmus, an isthmus is the land that goes, that basically lies between two big bodies of water. And so the isthmus of Panama was the, the thinnest place. And that was the location where a canal could be built so that ships didn't need to sail, you know, 13,000 miles around uh, the, the Cape, Cape Horn. Instead, they could go across that Panama Canal and save a lot of time, save a lot of money. And it was also a safety issue. If, if the U.S. needed to send warships somewhere and they had warships in the Atlantic Ocean, they could quickly get their warships to the Pacific Ocean. Now, now, uh, Teddy Roosevelt had uh, a saying. He said, walk softly and, and, and carry a big stick. 
And the idea behind that was use diplomacy, okay? Make sure people, you know, see you as dignified and uh, you don't want to threaten people unnecessarily. But if you see a threat, you have a big stick and you will put down trouble. And so that was his principle. And when he ran for vice president with President McKinley, that was their campaign slogan. And then he, he talked about it later on as well. Well, one thing that was kind of the, the walk softly part of this was Roosevelt's work on the world stage. He helped solve a, a war that was happening between Russia and Japan, the Russo-Japanese War. Again, you might say, I don't remember that war. That was in the early 1900s and involved uh, disputes over islands that are on the coast of Russia and also the coast of Japan. And they are disputed largely because of fishing rights. Well, Japan was a rising power in the world and Russia was declining. They had an empire, but it was weak. And so Japan, who had industrialized, they had built a navy, they were able to sink all of Russia's ships. Well, the United States then, uh, Teddy Roosevelt got involved and was able to uh, arrange a peace treaty between Russia and Japan. And the end of the Russo-Japanese War was a relief to the world. You know, everybody was afraid this would blow up into a bigger war uh, because Russia had a lot of allies and and uh, you know Japan actually was an ally of the United States at that time. And so uh, Teddy Roosevelt earned the Nobel Peace Prize. Even though he talked about that big stick, he earned the Nobel Peace Prize from his work there. Uh, at this time, he also dedicated uh, the Union Square memorials that we have, the, the Dewey Monument that we have here in San Francisco. And um, Teddy Roosevelt was also known as a, a big business monopoly buster. So again, that big stick, he used the big stick to keep corporations, businesses from becoming too big and threatening government authority and government power. And so he was a monopoly buster. Uh, and another thing he's known for is conserving the environment. So Teddy Roosevelt's face is up on Mount Rushmore for a reason. He had a huge impact, starting with the Spanish-American War, continuing to when he kind of stepped into the presidency after McKinley was assassinated, and he led the country to becoming a global power. Thanks for listening. I hope that this uh, Zoom through history hasn't been too intense for you.